Hello, everybody, and welcome. My name is Laura Reed, and I'm the CEO at Simulate. I'm here to present the first in a new series where we'll be interviewing a variety of movers and shakers and industry leaders from across the operations research community. We're looking to share best practice, gather inspiration on clever uses of simulation, and find out the thoughts and ideas of some of our industry's leading minds. As a global provider of process simulation software, working across sectors from automotive and manufacturing to pharmaceuticals and healthcare, the team here at Simulate are always very lucky to collaborate with lots of great people on exciting simulation projects. This series is a chance to invite more of you to share in the lessons that we pick up through these experiences, making simulation more accessible to all. We'll be finding out more from the innovators that are working so hard to drive the industry forward. And I'm delighted to say that our, we're starting at the top with today's chat. My guest is another Laura, Laura Albert, the president of INFORMS, the Institute for Operations Research and Management Sciences. Welcome to you, Laura. Hi there, good to have you here. Thanks for having me. I'm delighted to be here. So Laura has been influential in the field of operations research for many years and has a truly impressive resume. She is a professor and the David Gustafsson Department Chair of Industrial and Systems Engineering at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Her research interests are in the field of operations research, with a particular focus on applications in the public sector. Um, she's winner of countless awards. She's also the author of Punk Rock Operations Research, a science and engineering blog found at punkrockor.com. And if that isn't enough, she's also part of a team that uses advanced analytics and discrete event simulation to help forecast college football playoffs, which can be found at Badger Bracketology. Um, I won't pretend to know too much about American football being based here in Scotland, but I'll try and make sure we've got some time to chat a little at the end about this fun use of analytics. So, Laura, uh, firstly, thank you for giving us your time and welcome to today's session. It's really, really good to have you here. Um, firstly, let me offer you my congratulations on becoming the president of Informs. Um, I've seen so much of the great work that you've already contributed to both our industry and also to the Institute. And I think, you know, it's just a fantastic appointment for our audience. Could you please introduce yourself and tell us a bit about what Informs does? Sure. So, you know, in addition to being president of Informs, I'm also a professor and department chair in industrial systems engineering at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, in terms of Informs, it's the premier association for industry professionals and academics who apply science, math and technology and analytics and, of course, simulation to solve the world's most critical challenges. By keeping our members informed and connected, INFORMS empowers them to drive better decisions for a better world. INFORMS is a US-based institution, but it does boast an international membership and it has many international members from around the world. And I would like to point out that employers often um, pay memberships uh, for their employees so that they can become members of INFORMS or you know, and as well as other associations. And this is a really huge benefit, especially in this labor market. It's a benefit to employees who can grow professionally and build their professional networks to keep their skills up to date. That's great to hear. So so as president, um, what's your vision for the role of INFORMS and what are the key things that you'd like to achieve during this presidency? Yeah, first and foremost, Informs has given me so much over the course of my career, and it's a pleasure to give back. And you know, my goal for my one year as president is to put operations research, the whole community in the best position to make meaningful change to theory, computation and practice. So it is a bit of a heavy lift. I'm also president for a year. So part mm -hmm. of my vision is to do it sustainably because um, I would like the um, any efforts I make to to be able to be carried on into the future. Um, there are a few issues on my radar. Number one is membership, always looking at ways to strengthen the membership and the value proposition for members. One of area of focus this coming year is early career professionals. So especially maybe student members who will become industry professionals in the near future, looking at that transition and seeing what we um, can offer for that group. Um, the second is there have been many efforts in diversity, equity, and inclusion in the past years, and really seeking to keep that effort going to broaden participation in operations research and really to celebrate the broad range of contributions from all of our members. Um, so the DEI efforts, as we call them, is really at all levels. And there, we're also looking at artificial intelligence. This is um, an effort by Informs that's been going on for a few years, kind of on the enterprise level. 
So really focusing on uh, ways that we can ensure that our members can contribute to larger AI efforts and also receive recognition. We're also looking at some you know, outward facing efforts such as government advocacy and really communicating the value of what we do to government leaders. So there are opportunities and avenues for members of the OR community to influence policy and legislation and really expand our scope of influence to achieve greater impact. Um, industry le leaders like to hear about what's being done in our government leaders like to hear about what's being done in industry. It's, so these are proven methods that are really interesting to them. And finally, we are looking to introduce a tagline to better position informs in what we do as a community to our peers. Um, so we've made some progress so far, and I can talk about some of those as we go, but we have um, a new webinar series for early career professionals. We've introduced the associate CAP, which CAP is a certified analytics professional uh, a certification, and we're making it easier to get started and kind of a bridge uh, certification for early career members. We successfully modernized our constitution, which will be great for informs in the future. We've had a year of in-person conferences, fully in-person conferences, which has been fantastic for networking and getting to know the next generation and um, getting to know the latest research and happenings and operations research. We introduced a new journal, um, INFORMS Journal on Data Science, which that was in the works a few years ago. And previously when I was on the board, I did a vote to approve that journal. And it's really been exciting to see it have its first in print articles. It's really helpful for our community. Um, so stay tuned, there'll be more to come. And I already mentioned the tagline will be introduced in the coming fall. That'll be a nice legacy, as is a lot to achieve in a year. I know you made the point at the beginning, it is only a year. So mm -hmm. um, if I can pick up a couple of things, I was really interested to hear you mentioned AI. I mean, obviously there's a huge amount of interest in AI and machine learning currently. Where do you see um, AI making having the biggest impact in OR in operations research? You know, I see kind of two areas. One is you know, theory and computation, so many of the algorithms in AI are essentially optimization algorithms. Mm -hmm. And that part of our community that's in the interface of computer science and operations research has a lot of opportunities. And so we're seeking to make sure that there are some seats at the table, especially with research funding, to make sure that um, the folks that are in our community have those opportunities. Um, and the second is, you know, not all aspects of AI are super relevant to operations research, mm -hmm. but AI is a big umbrella. And we're seeing more and more um, artificial intelligence and in systems where decisions are maybe being automated and yeah. maybe a human works alongside some automated decisions. And that's like really relevant to operations research. As artificial intelligence reaches higher levels of maturity, there are more opportunities for operations research because we tend to be very good at thinking about these systematic issues and issues in systems that are complex. Yeah, and interesting enough, you've got soft and hard issues there, haven't you? Because you've also got the people element of the change to sort of factor in as well. So, um, and then you also, I was glad to you mentioned conferences, and it's good to hear they've been going for a year. Um, certainly simulate, I think we're ready to go back, but um, I feel that it's maybe a little bit harder as um, industry to encourage us to come back from industry. It's maybe easier for academics to see, you know, the, the benefits coming back. So what would you say to people in industry about coming back to informed conferences? Uh, you know, it's been wonderful. And we did have the, the analytics meeting, which is mostly industry professionals. Yeah. And what was so interesting about, and we've had two fully in person at this point, so many attendees at those conferences, it was their first conference in person because of it being impacted by, um, the pandemic. And, you know, one commonality that I noted there that's true for academics as well is that the early career professionals also need to build their professional networks. And the conferences are so valuable for that. Same issue in academia. I already have networks, so I've been able to draw upon that. And the, the interruptions weren't as um, challenging for me um, with the pandemic and not having access to, to in-person conferences. Um, but it's also been helpful for industry professionals to really build their skills, especially the soft skills and this professional development that really happens through the conference talks. Um, it's been interesting for me to observe as an academic, but there really are a lot of benefits to being in person when possible. Yeah, yeah of it's course, nice when you put it that way about the development, particularly for people in their early stage career. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And informed subdivisions have all sorts of meetings, hybrid and 
um, in fully virtual and some webinars. We have a, a mix, but the, the flagship uh, conferences that we have have been in person the past year. That's awesome. And the analytics conference that you mentioned, that sounds like would appeal to people in industry. Who Who's it for? Yeah, it's absolutely for people from industry. There are a few yeah. academics that attend, but usually they're doing you know, industry projects. And it's a smaller conference, so usually about, I think it was about 700 last year. Okay. So usually it's between about 700 and 1,000 versus the annual meeting, which is six or 7,000, mostly academics. But a lot of industry professionals go to the, the annual meeting because it just has so much going on and it's easy to mm -hmm. sort of find different communities and there's just more people to network with. So, um, but the, the analytics meeting has fewer tracks, a little bit more um, higher level talks with some more tangible takeaways for practice. I really love seeing the talks and there are some professional development streams and it's broadened to, to uh, encompass some emerging areas for the, the discipline, including you know, cybersecurity. Oh yeah, I know that is good. And I think actually, you know, you can, when we talk about network, you know, the smaller conference, big conference, they both offer benefits for networking, don't they? I mean, smaller might be easier for some people. Well, that, that's good to hear. Um, so, so let's so let's move on. So obviously like, we're going to sort of go back to the beginning. We've been talking about your presidency from this year, but if we go back to the beginning, um, could you tell me a little bit about your own career path and where your passion for operations research was first ignited? Sure. And it started when I was a college student in basically a systems engineering program. I first took a course on operations research. It was mostly linear programming, but it also covered some topics like engineering economics and um, yeah, I have to say that it was not love at first sight for me. I thought it was really interesting. I mean, I, the simplex algorithm is like amazingly cool the first time you see it. Um, however, I had to choose a senior design elective and I appreciated it enough to choose a design optimization course. And, and that's really where I fell in love with optimization and this idea that you could optimize several variables that are interconnected and and I learned about the algorithms. I learned about modeling. So I describe it as love at second sight. And I was yeah, just totally okay. hooked <laughs> when I saw optimization. And it was, you know, interesting enough that I did a master's degree and then started a PhD in industrial engineering. And I was really interested in, in applied research at that time, using operations research to study the emerging research area of aviation security. And that's when I first joined Informs, and I've been a member ever since. And that was over 20 years ago at this point. Yeah, I remember feeling like, I don't know if I describe love at first or second sight, but just feeling like a light had gone after my, on after my first introduction to operations research. Because up until that point, since I was probably a small child, I'd been good at maths. But it was hard to see where I could go with that and what impact I could have. And I actually think mine was actually turned out to be linear programming as well, what they called operations research. I thought, oh, right, I can see what I can do with this, you know, and I just felt like I could have an impact and I could see what my purpose was. So, um, yeah, I, I've never, never looked back as well, been really pleased with with my career. Um, and, and, and in those, I'm going back to sort of about 2007 when you were working um, Probably, I think your first year um, tenure track professor, this is when you started the punk rock operations research blog. Um, how would you describe your punk philosophy? And actually, what got you started with the blog? Yeah, I um, well, blogging was cool back then. I'd like to think that <laughs> blogging is still kind of cool. Um, but I really like writing. It's what academics do a lot. So it's good that I like writing. And I was at Virginia Commonwealth University at the time. And we I was in a statistics and operations research department. We didn't have many students. I'm like, oh, if I start this blog, maybe more students at the university would discover operations research. And I have to say it didn't exactly work that way. But I did, you know, attract an audience. And it was students at other universities. It was colleagues. And eventually it was the general public and, and also journalists. Sometimes journalists find me because they found a blog post. And, you know, what I've learned over the years is that, you know, those of us in OR, there's a certain lens that we look at the world with that's colored by our training. And, and I've been able to share that with the public. And it's been really nice. And I did convince some students to go into OR, but at other universities mostly. And it's been really nice to hear to hear them at meet them at conferences and then they they discovered OR through my blog and I'm very touched by that and honored to play a little bit of a role in that. Um, in terms of my punk philosophy, I know I don't look like the most punk person you've <laughs> ever met, but I will say that you know it is about for me it's using OR to make the world a better place through in my case public sector applications. 
there's definitely a strong bit of nonconformity in my blog. I mean, I am a blogging professor uh, for sure, which is unusual. I'm still blogging today when admittedly there's not that many blogs left. So um, I've definitely not conformed in that sense. And there's also this do-it-yourself attitude in punk, which I also think really fits us in our research communities and OR. I mean, we do it all ourselves when it comes to research. So I see a lot of overlap. Yeah, I can see that a lot of OR is about problem solving, isn't it? It's say do it yourself. I like that analogy. But it reminds me of just um something you said at the beginning, because you you said there that what really appeals to you um your punk philosophy about making the world a better place. And one of the first things you said about your presidency is about operations research is about making meaningful change. Um, what, what do you mean by that? You know, linking this idea of making the world a better place, meaningful change, what does that mean to you? That is such a good question. Um, it's multifaceted because mm -hmm. I think about what we do, most as a researcher, you know, we have theory and computation and application and then we also have the, the applied side the application and so it's really taking a bigger step forward we're going to do a lot of incremental make a lot of incremental change along the way um, but that meaningful change is really about ultimately leaving the discipline in better shape than you know and healthier than where we got it and it also encompasses diversity efforts you know who is doing or matters so much yeah, and I think I, I like you said leaving sort of the the leaving OR in a in a healthier place. But there's also if you think about so much we can contribute into the world, it is it's going to have massive impacts, isn't it? Societal impact we can have, etc. And that actually leads me on to my next question because um, you know, using simulation to make a positive change on society is something that's very important to us. It simulates part of our identity and we have our Tech for Good program. Um, and with the help of a team that are very passionate about this, we're always looking for opportunities to work with charitable organizations and those in need, you know, that can ensure that the benefits of simulation can be felt where the impact's most meaningful. We've always been about making simulation accessible. That's really, you know, it's a big part of what we do. Um, and that's included, we support health organizations during the pandemic, sort of think tanks, et cetera. Most recently with HIV charity in South Africa, also working with small charities um, and obviously you know we just talked there about you know it's important for you to feel about meaningful change um, you know what um what are some of your experiences or ideas about putting this in action yeah this is i think a great like secret of or history here you know operations or operational research really started you know in world war ii and in, yeah. in the uk and it was like and then it you know was also used and developed in the u.s and early OR was like very mission oriented. There were these challenges, there were sort of applied military challenges, but it was very military driven. But what was interesting is that, you know, when OR flourished after the war, you know, there was this effort, this is all before I was born, but in the US, there was this idea that, you know, if we could put a man on the moon, which is like a real technical challenge, we should also be able to solve some of these messy challenges here on earth using OR. And we should, you know, tackle these complex problems for social good. And, you know, I was really delighted to read about this history that goes back to this early part of OR history. And, and I really greatly admire how the OR community has never shied away from these messy, complex social problems that have this potential for social good. And, you know, you don't always see that in other scientific disciplines. And I really commend Simulate for continuing their work. And you mentioned it was like tech for good, yeah. which is um, which is fantastic. And there's a lot of um, examples from the operations uh, research community. The Operational Research Society in the UK started pro bono OR, mm -hmm. and Informs followed with pro bono analytics, where we seek to, both cases, find volunteers to help make a difference with operations research. And quite often, simulation is a part of the solution for many of these pro bono projects. Um, and Informs has its it, uh, the Franz Edelman Award, which is the Achievement in Applied Analytics, which is really putting OR in practice at scale to make a difference. And so many of the problems, or the the no, or the the Edelman laureates have really focused on social good. Uh, for example, last year's a winner in 2022 was the Chilean Ministries of Health, which used a suite of OR tools, including simulation, to help manage COVID-19. They looked at issues such as ICU capacity planning, increased testing capacity, how to manage lockdowns and the possible effects, and then also surveillance programs. And it's been really nice to see the social good being such a 
a focus area for the OR communities. Yeah, it was fantastic, wasn't it? it? Just it really felt like our community came together as well, didn't it? And we really pulled together, and then saw what we could do to support this sort of fight against against COVID. So, um, I mean, you mentioned you know some of the winner there of the Franz Edelman Award, but um, what do you think? To what extent? And, you know, we've got advanced economies like the US and like we have in European countries. You know, how can we share the benefits of our with our less developed nations? And is that anything that Informs is involved in or would like to be involved in? Yeah, we have an international office and okay. um, we work through I-4s and there are a lot of partnerships. There are, for example, reduced membership rates for uh, potential members from developing nations and there are discounted and or some free access to some journals in some cases to really help disseminate scientific knowledge. Awesome. I wasn't aware of that, and I'm sure a lot of our audience will be. And you mentioned I-4s there. I know who they are, but I'll get the acronym wrong, so it's probably, do you know, so we can let people know? <laughs> um, it's, I think, the International Federation of Operations Research yeah. Societies. Yeah. Yeah. Um, or something really close to that. Yeah, um, and so that is that is a way for um, or, um, individuals and organisations in other countries they can access. Um, well, it's, a, if it, it's an institute they can join, but it also gives them the access to things you mentioned there, like papers, etc. So um, that's great. Yeah. I wasn't aware of that. So great to have that to share. Um, so operational research can obviously have a positive impact on not just society, but sectors going back to industry. But on the flip side, I'm interested to hear whether you think there are any industries that aren't making the most out of what OR has to offer and what can we do to engage those industries? Yeah, absolutely. We've grown and we've expanded our scope of, of impact over time by growing, moving into new application areas. Um, one application area that I see right now that has a lot of promise is cybersecurity. Um, so much of, I mean, cybersecurity is a really, really massive area. On the enterprise level, it really is about managing risk in a dynamic environment with limited resources. And when you phrase it that way, it's like, wow, you know, OR, OR should be really central to, to that on the enterprise level for sure, if not on, on other levels. And there's a lot of um, data. There's a, a need for more good data in cybersecurity. There's a lot of uncertainty. And you know we've always been really good at managing risk in operations research. So I'm been glad to see this area slowly grow over mm -hmm. time, and I, I ex expect that there'll be more opportunities for our community in the future. I guess with what you have to be aware with, like ORMS, is the fact that it needs to be accessible. You know, I talked about we always have tried to make simulation accessible. So you mentioned there about the need to access data, etc. So I think that can be a bit of a blocker, can't it, to new industries when they try and think, you know, when they perceive what is needed to start to adopt ORMS techniques. But I suppose that's where organizations like Informs can help. Yeah, I yeah. mean, there can be a lot of data in cybersecurity in terms of, uh, you know, scans and whatnot, but then there's a little bit less of a data with you know, workflows and, you know, yeah. how much time it takes and what are the resources actually needed. and. Sometimes, because it's a dynamic environment, it really kind of begs the use of simulation or um, stochastic uh, methods to understand how to protect against some uncertain future events that could happen. Um, but there's we also a lot of proven OR methods as that well. Can work, yeah. and we were, what it also made me think of that we were involved, Simulate was involved a few years ago in an EU project, and it was about trying to make different types of simulation accessible to smaller organisations, so like your SM, SMEs, SMBs. Um, and I think that applies to, you know, that blocker applies not just to simulation, but obviously to other techniques as well. You know, if you're a small organisation, if you're a one man band, you could be benefiting from some of these techniques, but you don't have the the, the, the funds to invest in it. You don't necessarily have the time to do it yourself. So um, I don't know if there's anything that Informs are doing there to help small organizations adopt it. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I'm not totally sure since I'm yeah. more of an academic. Yeah, but it would be interesting one, isn't it? So maybe we'll hear from some of our audience on this at some point and we can bring it back to you. So um, so at the beginning, you talked about, um, one of the things you talked about with Informs was um, work around DEI and keeping that progressing. And, you know, we're proud at Simulate, we are an equal opportunities employer. We're lucky to have people from all kinds of backgrounds. Um, we're actually also a female-led business, like three quarters of our exec team is female, 60% of our development team is female. And if anybody knows anything about the tech sector, I mean, that is 
pretty phenomenal. Um, and throughout your career, you have served on a number of committees that are focused on increasing diversity within informs. In fact, you and I first met at um, a forum, I think, for one of the forums for women at ORMS. And I think you've, I know you've also won the 2019 award for the advancement of women in ORMS as well. So can you expand why um, and why this is so important to you and, you know, how what more are you going to do around this in your new role? Yeah, I mean, as a kind of a woman in engineering, it's it's been critically <laughs> important for me when I started when I was in college, I would say fewer than five percent of my professors were women and at least in engineering. Uh, the first conference I attended, uh, fewer than 5% women. And it was really hard for me to have a, you know, understand what my role could be or where I could fit in or how I could, you know, excel in the discipline and professional spaces. I'm also the first PhD in the family. So it's not like I had a parent that was, you know, navigating these spaces and could show me the way. And the first INFORMS conference I attended happened to be the first time that forum you mentioned, the Women in OR and MS, which we call WORMS, it organized a formal lunch. And um, then WORMS president and then future INFORMS president, Panar Keshanochek, organized it. And I felt so welcome at, to the table, uh, figuratively, of course, but also literally because there are actual tables there. And it was so, um, it was kind of a life altering experience to be at this professional conference and to feel so welcome after not feeling so welcome at. Um, other conferences I attended, and that that metaphor of being welcome to the table stuck with me. So I kind of used that in my career to help create more inclusive spaces, um, like the Worms Lunch, wherever I go, and try to welcome others in, let them know that you know they have a place at the table that's here. And you know, if we don't do that, we have a lot to lose um, as a community. So I've often said that who does OR matters as much as what we do in OR. And it's really important that we do broaden participation. And I've been around long enough that I can see that it really does make a difference. When we broaden participation, we study new applications that really have been invigorating and help keep our community healthy. And we also study old applications from a fresh perspective, which is also really useful. So I see it's really crucial. So my role as INFORMS president, though, really focuses on a couple of things. One is um, structural mechanisms, and I'm in a position to help with that. And so we've been updating our policies and procedures to make sure that we're being welcoming and inclusive and fair to our members. We also try to um, create mechanisms to celebrate a broad range of achievements from all members of our community. We've also created new subdivisions. Two new subdivisions have been um, in the past year. So one is the LGBTQA uh, subdivision, which is great. And the second is a military veteran subdivision. Um, mm -hmm. So this has been really nice to have communities. And these are all member led efforts. So really it's members stepping up and you know, us just doing what we can to help create these communities so that there can be more of a sense of belonging uh, among the members. Um, so that's what's going on right now. There is a council, the DEI Council at INFORMS, which is really fantastic and it's been really helpful in promoting best practices. And so one thing that happened this past year was introducing uh, an implicit bias video that's like OR centric that a lot of the subdivisions can watch and we've gotten good feedback on that. It's just a helpful reminder of you know things that we can do in informed spaces or in OR spaces to be more welcoming and inclusive. And this next year, they're going to tackle a couple issues, and that committee has gotten bigger, and they're going to have a few um, subcommittees to help with that. I think that's a good structure for um, tackling future change. Yeah, and you know, apart from the fact that you're helping all of us in the industry. Um, it's also probably giving us some ideas and inspiration about what we can do because, you know, I love that phrase, welcome to the table. Um, it's really, as you say, it really just conjures up what you need to do to all minority groups. And it, um, you know, we all want, we need diversity. We all want diversity. We're trying to do problem solving. Therefore, you need that diversity. And as you, you mentioned earlier about the labour shortage as well that we're facing. So it all makes a lot of sense to, to be able to do this. So, yeah, no, that, that is good to hear. There's a lot of ideas that hopefully our, our listeners or audience can take forward as well. Um, so moving on from that, um, what are your views on the branding of operations research? You know, are we doing enough to promote its role 
in both business and society. You mentioned you do obviously some work in, in government um, and what more can be done and what more, I suppose, what it, what can informs do, but what can all of us do? Yeah, I mean, OR should not be a well-kept secret. And so it's, I think it's always going to have to be a priority. (laughs) We're never going to be the biggest, you know, community out there. Um, And if you're like me, you're asked what OR is quite often. And this is a big reason why Informs is introducing the tagline this this coming year to help with that and help um, position ourselves uh, better. Uh, Also throughout my career, I've done a lot of public outreach. So this is something that we can all do either as individuals or companies or universities is really talk about um, what operations research is. And, you know, generally the public likes hearing about OR, they like hearing about the solutions and um, the great work that you do for social good at Simulate. Um, And the public also likes hearing how we get the best use out of limited resources. This is so like, it's so interesting to them, Um, especially in the public sector, you know, people that are taxpayers and they want to want to know that we're making good use of these limited resources. Um, Same thing for nonprofits, because a lot of people do donate and make contributions. They love hearing about how it makes a difference. And the public really right now also wants to hear about artificial intelligence. So that's a great hook for us in operations research to kind of keep talking. Um, But I've made it a priority to be public facing in my career because it is really important when people hear what we do, they are more likely to support Uh, university research that funds operations research. They support higher education in general. And also government leaders really like hearing about proven methods that are widely used in industry. So it's great to um, promote OR in that sense. And that creates a bit of a virtuous cycle. Um, It is work and it's about, we can all do a little bit. And um, it does lead to healthier communities in operations research down the road. Yeah, I think I think what we find we put a lot of our effort into this is in sort of um, actually sort of even before people move into a career in this is trying to raise awareness at schools, trying to raise awareness at mm-hmm. colleges and universities. Um, but one of the things that I've come across and I've heard I've heard this from sort of the wider STEM community is um, sometimes it's really hard to educate children and young people because their parents aren't aware of it. So some mm-hmm. of the education you do in the, the grown up community they can actually benefit, you know, our, us in the future. So um, the other thing that occurred to me as you're speaking there is not only do we and we do have to fight, I think, to get it recognised. We do have to fight to get our name known. I mean, my family still don't know what I do after 20 odd years. So, mm-hmm. we, you know, we have to fight to get OR recognized in the world of work but I know from our customers sometimes they don't even get their recognition in their organizations you know they're they're fighting to be heard there as well and do you think you know the OR community um does enough to bridge that divide with general ma- management and if not you know ha- what could we do I don't see this as an informed thing but what can we all do to just to even get that internal recognition yeah and this is uh that's a great question and you know, I think one thing that professional organizations can do is to really help create ways to recognize that mm-hmm. through kind of awards or which is typically how we do that in professional organizations. Um, but I, I will say that there, this was discussed in a few of the sessions I attended at the analytics meeting. And so this is also goes back to this importance of being able to attend kind of practice oriented conferences yeah. and being able to discuss this as a community because I think there are solutions that do bubble up from the bottom of how to make how to communicate this because it does show up again and again and that through networks you know that can really help make the case within an organization. Yeah that's nice isn't it so you can lean on your community to understand what they're doing in their organizations and I think the other organizations I think we're probably quite a modest bunch and we maybe need to get better at shouting about what right. we do and promoting what we do as well and talking about the outcomes not just the inputs I think that would make a huge difference so um, and so I, I this next question is a tough one um, as someone who has you know a huge amount of great experience um, what do you think is the most exciting part of working in this sector? It, it's hard to come up with just one thing, <laughs> um, you know, so I'm going to maybe give you two, but okay. one is just Whoa. like doing research with students is just really fantastic. And that's one okay. way that, you know, that I try to personally make sure that the future of OR is is uh, as healthy by educating the next generation. And it's such an honor to do that. Um, but really what I've been enjoying is seeing some policy impact of my research. 
you know, I always try to do technical work that's really high quality, but then working towards making a difference with policymakers and government leaders, um, and really kind of doing research to have some takeaways from the work that we do. And as part of this, I've been uh, writing more op-eds that have been published in various media outlets and newspapers in the U.S. to talks about the value of the work that we do and some of the insights that hopefully will be read by policymakers. So this is something that has been really exciting to me in these past couple of years, for sure. Yeah, and I just, um, the research you're doing with students about educating the next generation, you know, I, I actually think that links back to our previous question there about raising awareness is, I don't think that's something that's just restricted to academics. It's something that all of us in industry can be doing as well to help educate that next generation. So, um, and for anyone who's, you know, watching to and is curious about the benefits of becoming a member of Informs, what are the different opportunities for them to get involved? I know you touched on a couple at the beginning, but if you just give us a little bit more information. Sure, I'll give you about five different ways that, yeah, that would be know, good. a new yeah. member could get involved. You know, most members uh, join, they first join when they attend an in-person conference, typically one of the big ones. So we have two big conferences that meet every year, the analytics conference in April, and then the INFORMS annual meeting, which is mostly but not exclusively academics in usually October. Um, outside of that, um, most members that you know continue to stay members are active in subdivisions. So you can join the overall umbrella organization, but it's really big. And so different subdivisions help find community based on a specific person's interest. Some that might be relevant to anybody watching today is in the Applied Probability Society, the Healthcare Application Society. We mentioned the Women in OR and MS Forum. And through these subdivisions is really the best way to volunteer. That's how I really got hooked and active in informed service. Um, the third is we have some message boards that um, allow for asynchronous virtual uh, interaction. We have an open forum, which is all the members, but there's also subdivision forums. And this past year, Inform started an industry open forum for, it's really available for everybody, oh, but nice. it's been more for, for um, industry and members in industry, which is, I think has been really nice to create some community there. Um, fourth is we do have a few webinar series. I mentioned the early career one, which is called the Inform's Insights Exploring Industry Career Paths and Experiences. But there's also different webinar series with some of the subdivisions, including a DEI webinar series. And lastly, there's actually a book club at Informs, and I'm a member, and it's been fun because there's a book to read, and we actually have these virtual synchronous meetings on Zoom where we discuss books. And I missed the last one, but I read the book. Um, they are choosing a new book right now, so it's a good time to uh, get involved. Oh, wow. Okay, so that's what I hear. There's this nice range of activities to suit people with different types of questions, different points in their career, some remote, some face to face. So yeah, really ticking off everything. And for I, I we maybe should have, I don't think I started this beginning. How many members does Informs have? It has about twelve thousand members. Yeah, you twelve thousand members. So by you know by becoming part of Informs, you're getting access to all that you know wealth of knowledge. And then the the subdivisions you're talking, you know, I know it probably varies, but roughly how many people? If I was to join, say the applied probability one. That might be a larger one with several hundred members. Okay, so again, you're getting access to all that that information mm -hmm. and knowledge, which is fantastic. And you mentioned the industry open forum there. So um, what type of things would people use that for? Oh, really interesting professional develop questions and comments, okay. sharing resources. So it's been, um, yeah, it's been interesting to see some of the discussions that are started there. Okay, and to, to view the forums, get a membership and then you can you can see the text yeah. or something that's going on right no sounds good um so we're glad to hear we actually have a little bit of time left so we can um get on to um something for our football fans which is a quick rundown of how your team is applying ORMS techniques to predicting the playoffs yeah so this is American football for sure yeah. and in the U.S. we have uh our universities have athletics and about a decade ago they they started a college football playoff. And so I started to dip my toe into uh, football analytics. And what I do is, you know, the teams play about roughly about once a week. So there yeah. is some structure to the season. And I used the data from the teams, which is point differentials where the, the teams were played. And using Markov chains and logistic regression, I'm able to rank the teams and I give some a rating for each team. And then the simulation comes in because, um, 
at the, I'm trying to predict at the end of the season who will be the top teams that will make it into the playoffs. And so I'm able to use a data driven simulation that uses that ratings and their future um, matchups and games adjusting for where the game is played. And I can simulate the next week of games, re rank, and then repeat till I get to the end of the season. And it's really interesting because you can see that that path to the playoffs, which is the remaining schedule, mm -hmm. is really crucial in, in these predictions. And simulation, of course, can have that structure in there. Um, so instead of just guessing, we can make a more informed guess using simulation. And it works, it's worked out really well. I, I find it amazing that, and kind of beautiful, actually, that just with math, I can rank the teams and make predictions as well as an expert or even better. And there's not that many games in the season, so it's really small data, but um, our tools well, are really powerful. So, yeah. And they're really able to extract a lot of lot from that information to make informed predictions. Yeah, isn't it interesting that we're not, you know, we talked about AI earlier, but we're not seeing more of a push with this type of informed, you know, analytics. As you say, we base it more on like a commentator's gut feel, don't we, what's going to happen at the end of the season. So that's a really fascinating application because I've been aware, um, this was a few years ago in my career, of ORMS techniques being used for team selection, actually, in, I think it was in rugby, but I've never heard it being applied for this. So very interesting. I'm sure we'll probably get some follow-up questions from people um, on, on this one. Um, you know, that is really us. Um, what can I say from talking to you today? I've just got a real sense of how passionate you are about OR um, and how it can be a force for good um, for many changes of or many areas of society. Um, it's fantastic that we've got someone like you at the helm of Informs this year. I'm sure you're going to deliver a lot of good and, you know, looking forward to hearing what you're going to do with that. So really just a big thank you from, you know, on behalf of our viewers and myself for such an fascinating and inspiring insight. And it would be really good if we could do a follow-up session at some point, maybe at the end of your year, and we can follow up to see, to see how some of it's gone. So thank you also to all our listeners today, and we look forward to welcoming you to our next episode. Thank you. Thanks for having me.